you can always fail. You can fail at something you don't love. So you might as well fail at doing what you love. It, the sad truth isn't that you'll fail. I think that if you build a startup and you really work towards it on a long enough time horizon, you'll probably be able to make something and make somewhat of a living. But the sad truth is it just won't be super eventful many days. Many days will just be really boring. I worked my whole life, eight years of my life, startups, eight years, zero, 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 just failing, failing, failing. Finally, I'm finally able to peak a little bit above the clouds and I feel like we're finally growing. And then I get a cancer diagnosis. Hi, my name is David. I'm 27 years old. I'm the CEO of Jenny AI. Jenny AI is an academic AI assistant. Helps you with research, writing, and everything in between. So we've raised from Jason Calcanis. We also have the AI grant, which is Nat Friedman and uh, Daniel Gross. We grow about 15 to 20% per month continuously for the last 10 months. We're at about two and a half million ARR and we're at over 2 million users globally. I think now every single country in the world there are now Jenny users, which is nice. I don't know. I think definitely just I had a lot of growing up to do. My parents, you know, my family wasn't rich, but my parents really gave me a lot of love, a lot of confidence. In, in, that, in a lot of ways that helped because, you know, I was able to believe in myself and do crazy things like start a company. My first business was a clothing brand where we would just sell to people in my high school, sell to people in neighboring high schools. Obviously it was my first business, I failed pretty spectacularly, lost all my money. I was 16 years old, I was just, I didn't know the basics of business, I just, uh, I was pretty naive, I thought, if you build something cool, that's the most important thing. It's not enough to just make a t-shirt and then just give up and just say, now I'm gonna be a millionaire. I remember the coolest, the coolest moment of my life was when I sold clothes, I, I didn't really sell that much, but I was at the mall one time and I saw this really tall, athletic, just like, jock kind of guy, someone who would never really be my friend. Uh, he was wearing one of the sweaters that I made. It was a really cool feeling because what I built was so valuable, what I built was so cool that he was willing to wear it. I think ever since then I've always been kind of interested in making products provide value to people. I went to college, I actually dropped out of college. I was on a plane from Seattle to San Diego. I went to UC San Diego, I was on a plane and there's a guy sitting next to me and I saw he had Coinbase open. Coinbase is like how you trade crypto in America and I realized he was probably pretty rich. So he was my captive prisoner for three hours. He couldn't leave, we were on a plane so I could just continually pitch him my startup idea. I think he was annoyed but I think he recognized that I really cared about what I was building. So I think less than three days after the plane landed, we met up, he gave me a cashier's check, my first investment ever. And then I dropped out of college and then I immediately went full time. And then my first business after was, uh, it was a social media where I was in college, I would meet so many people and they'd say like, add me on Snapchat or add me on Instagram or here's my LinkedIn. So I, we made an app that uh, you click one button and then you get added on Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, LinkedIn all at once. It didn't do well. I, I, I didn't know how to like get customers at the time. I didn't know like network effects at the time. I, we also weren't building for our users. We, we made a lot of poor decisions product wise. Then I made a dating app startup, which also failed. The dating app startup was uh, actually pretty cool. It was like an AI dating app where you don't swipe at all. And we use machine learning to look at your face and your previous partners to see who you might be physically attracted to. And then look at your Facebook to see like your interests and then try to find people. And then we partnered with uh, restaurants in the city and then set up your first date for you at a restaurant you both liked with the coupon. So it was like a concierge service. And the local businesses also loved it because they got free customers. They got these customers coming in from our dating app. Uh, but when I went to raise money, and then the VC, actually, you know, I'm not gonna invest in your startup because we actually want them to stay on your dating app as long as possible. If they find a boyfriend or girlfriend and they get happy, they're gonna delete the app, not renew their subscription, and you're not gonna have a billion dollar business. Honestly, that was really sobering for me. I was still, what, like 19, 20 at the time, so when I heard that, I felt like I had just crossed the chasm into like the adult world of like venture capital, and um, I was pretty disillusioned. And that, I actually, we actually stopped working on that because that was just such a crazy sobering moment. You know, when I failed my first startup, it didn't feel good, but it didn't feel that bad because I was still a student in college. So I was like, this is what life's about. It was only when I fa started failing after I dropped out of college, that was when I really felt a lot of pressure, felt pretty bad. You know, I would see on Instagram, my friends would be graduating. They'd have those fucking pictures with the, the graduation gowns and the hats and they'd be. And then I would be at home either living with my parents or working on some startup that wasn't really doing that well. And then fast forward a year and they'd have high paying jobs at Microsoft. And then I would still be, same thing, I'd still be at home, still not doing well. And I think those failures really hurt a lot more because even though I wanna say like, oh, I, don't, I try not to compare myself to people, I try to like be the best version of myself, you can't have full control over your mind. So it was a, it was a little hard to, you can always fail. You can fail at 
something you don't love. So you might as well fail at doing what you love. The valuable lesson for me, your gut instinct, it actually rarely provides me much value. The blueprint for like a billion dollar company, it's kind of ripped up and scattered among minds and actions of the users that you're trying to build for. And like you have to be both egotistical enough to believe that you're you can genuinely make a billion dollar company, which is like a wild statement, I think. And then also humble enough to realize that you really don't know much and you have to continually talk to users. If you have ego, it could be strange at first. But I think once you like put that down, I think just your, your startup can blossom a lot better, I think. I was a literature major, so I really loved poetry in college, so I loved writing. And then my co-founder was a computer science engineer. He eventually did his PhD in natural language processing. So writing and AI, we always wanted to kind of find some way that we could connect those two. We started Gen AI when there was only GPT-2. And I remember we were just playing with it and there was one crazy generation that we got. The AI spit back, nothing is darker than a butthole. That's what the AI told me. And I thought that was so funny. I thought that was the funniest thing I've ever read that no human has ever said to me before. And then at the time, for some reason, I thought it was kind of profound as well. I'd be like, this is so crazy. The fact that an AI wrote this, we have to find some way to make a business out of this. And I really don't recommend anybody do this. We just got really lucky. In the beginning, Jenny AI, we could just make human writers 10% faster with GPT-2. And that was the first to Jenny. So we bring in writers to our office and then we time them with, with AI, without AI. And we'd be like, okay, we got, we're aiming for 10% faster, 15% faster, 20% faster. And then GPT-3 came out and then we realized, holy guacamole, this uh, GPT-3 is actually like insane. It could actually give you text that's useful. And that's when we transitioned from an agency more to a SaaS. And we said, okay, we don't actually need human writers because GPT-3 is so good. Then we became more of a general tool. So like anybody could use it. It was just like Microsoft Word, but you AI first. And then we started removing features. It's a weird thing. As we've removed features, Jenny continually got better. And then as we kept ripping things out, our vision just got more clear. This is the thing that people come for. How can we make this our time to value? Can we make it so a user comes and gets their first autocomplete? within the first five minutes. The way we got our first few customers, I would literally just cold call businesses. I would literally just talk to them, become their friends and try to like figure out how could I deliver the best product for them. And then the few users that came to us, we would talk to them and then we would tweak our tool a little bit and then we'd launch again and we'd tweak it and launch again. And then eventually we realized we had a huge wave of users and they were all students. And we just made the decision then like, it seems like these researchers, these people in the academic field, like they like Jenny, we, we might as well keep building for these people that actually like get value from our tool. In the beginning, you care a lot about money because obviously you're a struggling founder, but really in the early stages, money doesn't matter at all, especially if you're trying to build like a big company. So, you know, if you can convince someone to talk to you about your product and try your product and you can give them like a month free or two months free, that's no problem at all. You know, I see some founders, they're a little arrogant and they say, I'm not going to give anyone my product for free. Like, but the lifeblood of any startup just building, I think, is just knowing what to build. If you continually talk to users, you start to kind of understand where you need to go. And your like, gut instincts get a lot faster. Your product sense gets a lot better. Some tips I would have is prioritize talking to users more than anything else, more than money. Sometimes you have to ask uncomfortable questions too. When you have a user on the phone with you, it can be really rare. Like in the early stages when you only have 10 users and one of them gets on the phone with you, you don't know when the next one's gonna get on the phone with you. So you wanna really ask, you don't wanna just fluff yourself up and be like, What's your favorite thing about my product? You know, and like that doesn't really give you any information. It's just going to make you feel slightly better. If you have the end goal in sight, you need to ask, what does your current workflow look like? What's the biggest pain point that you currently have? And then when it's actually applicable, don't ask about the good things about your startup. Ask about the bad things because users will, they'll always try to be polite. Some of them will straight up lie to you and some of them will just be polite and not even realize they're lying to you. So you have to ask, you have to judge a lot based upon their actions. I think you just have to go and you just have to talk to users and then you have to put yourself in uncomfortable situations and slowly you'll start to feel a, po start to feel a pocket a little bit and just become more comfortable over time. When you're an early stage startup, you have nothing going for you. You will take any call. I remember when I was really struggling, I would even respond to those spammy LinkedIn messages I would get where they're clearly just messaging a thousand people, but I would even respond to them because I just needed anything. I needed, I needed anything because we were struggling so much. And I remember one time I got invited to a podcast. Very, very few people listen to this podcast. And I think out of the listeners, one out of the very small pool of listeners happened to be a scout for Jason Calcanis. And then the even crazier luck was 
they sent me an email saying, hey, we want to meet with you, possible investment. I didn't see the first email. I ignored the first email. So that, that, that was really unlucky. And then they actually decided to send another email. I responded to the second email. They decided to put 100K. I remember when I first got it, I went to my grand, grandpa's house. And then, uh, you know, we were like, holy, you know, I mean, we were just swearing in Korean, just like 100K. I, I remember I took a screenshot. I've never seen that much money in my life. I took a screenshot of it and I just stared at it all the time. And it was so crazy. Immediately after the 100K, when he invested in me, my startup was not doing super well. We kind of had a little bit of growth, but it wasn't, it was like, we made $2,000 month one, 2,200 month two, 2,300, 2,000, like very small growth. Like it was like almost negligible. I almost didn't trust myself with the money because uh, I was a young founder. I was kind of unsure of my own decision. So immediately my co-founder and I, we booked a flight to Malaysia, Southeast Asia, because everything in Malaysia is one fourth of the price. And just like we predicted, we were still young founders. We were making amateur decisions. It took us another year and a half to two years to finally grow. Like we were stuck at 2000-ish MRR for one and a half, two years. If I didn't go to Malaysia, we would have died before. And then it was a one and a half, two years of just continual failure. And I remember the craziest story ever. I got invited to something called KSGC, K Startup Grand Challenge. And if you get top 10, you get make a lot of, you, you win some money as well as a competition. So I went to Korea, we were really low on money and I was able to get a VC to invest $250,000. It was pretty much a done deal. But then I also, there was this girl I really liked. <laughs> I really liked this girl. And I had a meeting the next day with this VC that he was gonna invest in us. And then just because I was dumb, I was like, it's okay, I can just you know, stay out late. I, I stayed up really late with her. I came back, I realized there was some document I needed to fill out. I opened it, I realized it's in fully in Korean. And my Korean's like, it's okay, but I can't like do a legal document in Korean. So then I'm doing like the most ugliest like Google Translate trying to fill this document before I'm meeting at 9 a.m. I finish at like 3 a.m. I barely sleep. I wake up at eight. I get there. I'm late to the meeting. That night he sends me an email saying, actually, I, we don't, we're not gonna invest. We don't think that this is the right fit. That night, because we were two months away from dying. We we're two months away from dying. And I had a team. I had one software engineer either his wife was pregnant at the time or they just had a baby. I realized I had a lot of responsibility and I really messed it up. I cried pretty hard that day. That was like one of the worst days of my life. But luckily I was able to make some last minute calls. There was a VC that was interested before that I was able to get to come in. Gives a little bit of runway, which gave us just enough time. But the moral of that story is, why do entrepreneurs be entrepreneurs? Right? We want to avoid the nine to five. We want to feel free. We want to live life on our own terms. And I had a lot of that, you know, I thought, these VCs, they're lucky to invest in my startup. I'm, I'm doing very well, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. But to be honest, being a founder is probably, you have to be probably even more so disciplined. You have to be even more disciplined than the person, you know, waking up every day, showing up to every meeting because there's an insane amount of responsibility. The people who join your startup, they bet on you. All of the people that join my startup, they could get prestigious jobs anywhere. There's a lot of people relying on you and I really messed it up. It's just important to like, you take on all this leverage, you take on all this risk. So it's important that you act like it. I think. I remember I was sitting at home. It was late. I'm kind of a night owl. So my co-founder was asleep. It was around like 11 p.m. Suddenly our site starts going crazy. I see like every time I refresh the page, every second 10 users would come to Jenny, every second. Jenny's actually included in one of the most viral Twitter threads in history. I think it's actually the most viral Twitter thread in history that has to do with like AI or has to do with startups. It is the most viral Twitter thread. And we had open AI credits at the time. And we had a limit of, I think, like 1,000, 5,000 open AI credits, which at the time was a lot. I think within one hour, we lost all the credits. The users used all the credits because we had such a crazy influx. And then I'm calling my co-founder. He's not waking up. I remember I was like, just swearing at him on Slack. I was like, wake the f This is our big break. We have to like capitalize on this. I was just handling intercom messaging every single person, trying to save every single person. Hey, we're not available right now, but can you give me your email? We'll let you know when we're available. Because I, I didn't know if this was a one-time thing or this was gonna be a sustained thing. That was the first time we ever had the feeling of like some semblance of success. Because raising money doesn't feel like success. It feels like, okay, now the job really starts. Now we have, we can really get our hands dirty. After that first initial growth, I was, I was preparing my heart. I was like, okay, there's no way that we can continue growing like this. That was the most viral Twitter thread ever. Like, there's no way we can continue this growth. But, you know, we'll continue our best and we'll continue slowly. But it didn't stop. Every month, we were able to figure out some new distribution or growth tactic. And it just, the growth has been super awesome. That month 
was two months after the most viral tweet. Yeah, so I was in Korea. I always had this like growth on my jaw. I get it checked out every once in a while. It's like, okay, it's been like a few years, I'll check it again. So I went to go get checked. And then she was like, since you're here, do you want to check your neck too, since you're here? I was like, okay, sure. You know things are not good when the nurse is suddenly quiet. And then she says, 50% chance that you have uh, thyroid cancer because they see some tumors in my thyroid. I didn't know what to say. At that point, I still didn't think I had cancer because my entire life, all I've known is a life without cancer. So it's hard to imagine. And then I remember I saw, I got an email from the doctor saying that I had thyroid cancer. And I remember like this quote of, a tree can't reach heaven unless its roots reach hell. And that's how I really felt of like, I worked my whole life, eight years of my life, startups, eight years, zero, 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 just failing, failing, failing. Finally, I'm finally able to peak a little bit above the clouds and I feel like we're finally growing. And then I get a cancer diagnosis. Before my surgery, I was like, I don't want my startup to die if I die. So I wanted to raise a little bit of money. But unfortunately, I think that the VCs could smell the desperation. That was like, not only am I raising money, I need the money within the, you need to wire it within this month. It was, yeah, it was a weird, it was a weird situation. So I remember the day of the surgery was really crazy. I was really nervous for the surgery. And then the, uh, the doctor comes in and says, oh, you have a fever. We don't know if we can do the surgery today. Would you like to reschedule it? And I said, there will always be probably some reason. So I said, you know, let's just, let's just do it. And then my temp body temperature kept going up before the day of the surgery. So they start bringing ice packs. I, I'm just laying in bed, ice packs all over my body. And I remember my mom, she saw that I was really stressed. She sat next to me and she said, you know, don't worry, don't worry, things will be okay. Um, before your surgery, I'll tell you something and it's gonna give you all the strength you need and everything will be okay. My mom leaves a little bit, I think go to the bathroom or something and then suddenly all the nurses run in and they're like, we just have the operation table, someone like pulled out, we need to do surgery now. Um, I was about to go in surgery, my mom wasn't there, they weren't gonna get, I, I, I was afraid I wouldn't understand the instructions. I had a fever, the risk of like, my surgery was higher, all these things, so I wanna leave. But for some reason in the waiting room, there was like a Bible verse on the ceiling. And it said something about like, don't be afraid, leave it all up to, you know, God. So I, and then they took me to the surgery room. They did the surgery, I woke up, um, surgery went well. After a few days, I was able to speak. And I remember I asked my mom, I was like, hey, what was that thing you wanted to tell me before the surgery? And she was like, oh, I wish I could have told you. It was this Bible verse that I found online. And it was the same Bible verse that was on the ceiling. I'm not a very religious person, but for some reason I was like, okay, you know what? So much of my life has been like these miraculous things. I'm just like sitting next to my first investor on a plane, having Jason Kelly invest in me from a random podcast, having a crazy viral tweet from someone I've never met, getting cancer. I guess to sum it up, like I've just been so grateful for like my little miracles every day. I'm just really grateful all the time. <laughs> uh, lately, I don't know why, but startups, it's been romanticized with like all these Netflix series of like Theranos or Uber and a lot of startups really is just, it's not very sexy. It's just putting in the work day after day, finding out what's the most important thing to do. And sometimes the most important thing to do is just like get out a spreadsheet, look at these numbers, find out some relationship. And then the next day through that relationship, how can you make a product decision based on that? These things are never shown in these Netflix series or these movies, like, cause they've been kind of fetishized. It, the sad truth isn't that you'll fail. I think that if you build a startup and you really work towards it on a long enough time horizon, you'll probably be able to make something and make somewhat of a living. But the sad truth is it just won't be super eventful many days. Many days will just be really boring. The dread of like staring to the void, not knowing what's gonna happen is so much more painful than now. Every day there's probably some fire. I probably have to make huge decisions every single day in terms of like how to spend money, who to hire, who to partner with, whether to take a check from this person. Like, and it's not nearly as painful as when I was in my room alone and it was just super boring and I had to do like these boring things. I had no idea what to do. And it was just like not even eventful. So um, I guess my advice is like, just be ready. Just be ready for the many years of putting in the hours, putting in the reps. I wish you the best of luck, I guess, yeah.